Welcome to the next module of the Image in Life course. In this unit, we will talk about the principles of single molecule microscopy. This is a technique which enables scientists to image individual fluorescent molecules, locate their position with high accuracy, and follow their movements over time. We will have a look at a typical single molecule microscopy setup, and I will show you the application of this technique in living zebrafish embryos. Here we see a typical image sequence obtained using our single molecule microscopy setup. We see many bright spots which represent fluorescently labeled proteins moving inside the living cells. At this point you might wonder, what kind of information does a movie like this provide and why would we need this information? To answer these questions, you need to realize that the functioning of a cell depends on a complicated interplay between many different molecules, such as proteins and nucleic acids. These biochemical reactions form signaling pathways that convert extra or intracellular signals into changes in the functioning of the cell. A detailed analysis of these dynamic processes requires imaging techniques that are able to visualize molecules individually with high spatial and temporal resolution. This makes it possible to investigate whether there exist multiple subpopulations of molecules or differences in the behavior of individual molecules over time. A typical single molecule microscopy setup consists of the laser box that generates the excitation laser beam. This laser beam is directed through the objective on the sample and excites photons in fluorescent molecules. For example, yellow fluorescent protein, commonly known as YFP, that is expressed in living cells. The emission light from the fluorescent molecules is captured by an objective with a very high numerical aperture, which is a measure of the photon collection capacity. The higher the numerical aperture, the more emitted photons can be collected by the objective. A high numerical aperture combined with a high magnification allows us to locate individual molecules with high spatial resolution. The positional accuracy we can achieve for YFP in living cells is around 25 nanometers. Subsequently, we use a high sensitivity CCD camera to take images with a high temporal resolution between 1 to 50 milliseconds. Using these movies, we can track individual molecules and analyze their mobility patterns. We can obtain information about the number and size of subpopulation of molecules, their diffusion coefficients, and whether they are freely diffusing or are confined within a certain area. Using this single molecule microscopy setup, we have the possibility to switch from the standard epifluorescent mode to total internal reflection fluorescent microscopy, TERF for short. In TERF microscopy, the position of the laser beam is changed such that it hits, at the very large angle, the interface between the sample and the thin glass cover slip on which the sample is mounted. When this angle is larger than the critical angle, the laser beam is totally reflected at the interface and doesn't reach our sample. However, this reflection of the incident beam creates an evanescent wave above the glass sample interface that excites fluorophores within 50 to 200 nanometers above the cover slip. When working with living cells, TERF dramatically reduces the background signal due to the low penetration of the excitation light into the cells. But the use of single molecule microscopy is limited to the analysis of fluorescent molecules in and around the plasma membrane. Now, I would like to show you how we perform TERF-based single molecule microscopy in living zebrafish embryos. In our embryos, we only excite fluorescent molecules in the outer cell layer of the epidermis. Therefore, we can reduce any signal coming from the rest of its body to a minimum. It is important to note, however, that TERF microscopy is not optimal for any measurements deeper into the zebrafish body, as the evanescent wave doesn't reach those areas. Our embryo has been injected at around the one cell stage of its development, with a plasmid DNA construct that contains a YFP fused to a membrane protein, for instance the ATRAS protein. It is important to inject the DNA construct as early as possible during development, to increase the uptake by the cells before the majority of cells lose their connections with the yolk sac. The zebrafish embryo is then incubated at 28 degrees Celsius. In our experiment, we use a wild-type zebrafish embryo. Using an albino or Casper line with decreased pigmentation might be beneficial because it lowers the autofluorescent signal coming from the pigmented cells. 
We let the embryo develop for around 48 hours and most of them will hatch from the chorion around this stage. By incubation in tricane, we anesthetize our zebrafish embryos so they will not move during the subsequent mounting and imaging procedures. For mounting, we place the embryo on the cover slip using a pasture pipette. These cover slips have previously been cleaned thoroughly and are kept in a sterile environment. We put a drop of water on the top of the embryo to keep it hydrated during the measurements. The tail region of these embryos can be imaged most easily. We press the tail fin onto the cover slip by placing a thin agarose sheet on top of this part of the embryo. This will make sure that the evanescent wave reaches the outer membrane of cells in the outer layer of the embryonic epidermis. Now we can transfer our sample to the microscopy setup to begin the imaging of fluorescently labeled membrane proteins in our embryo. In order to do that, we first need to locate the embryo and focus the image. For this step, we use the standard epifluorescent mode of our setup. After focusing on the tail of the embryo, we switch to the turf mode by changing the position and the angle of the incident laser beam. At a certain position, the beam is totally reflected and we are in the turf mode, which is immediately clear from a dramatic increase in the signal-to-noise ratio. Next, we can choose the desired frame size of our picture, the duration of our illumination, as well as image acquisition, and the time lag between subsequent images. An ideal picture has a good signal-to-noise ratio and no aggregates of fluorescent molecules that might influence the analysis. Using the desired settings, we obtain a series of images that can be used to analyze the mobility patterns of our molecules of interest. In this way, we went through the entire process of sample preparation and image acquisition that are required for turf-based single molecule microscopy in zebrafish embryos. And here we are, back at the images you saw earlier that show fluorescently labeled individual HRAS protein in the outer membrane of the epidermal cell layer of zebrafish embryos tail fins. I hope that you can see the potential in measuring the dynamics of the single proteins inside the living organisms. We can now validate earlier observation in cell cultures in a real in vivo system. Additionally, we can study how an intact vertebrate animal adapts to environmental factors like light, stress or pathogens at the molecular level. You can imagine its application in a variety of research areas, such as pharmacology and cancer research. These techniques are still evolving and will improve even more in the near future. We are trying to adapt our turf-based approach to be able to image cytoplasmic or nuclear proteins in the outer cell layer of the epidermis. Subsequently, using light sheet microscopy, we are developing an approach to image single molecules in cells beyond the outer epidermal cell layer. That will certainly increase the possibilities and the applicability of measuring the mobility patterns of single molecules inside living organisms.